choosing celebration, breaking into freedom. You're the song, you're the song of a heart. We cast aside our shadows, trust you with our sorrows. You're the song, you're the song. just a canvas for your grace and brightness. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts. We're dancing to the rhythm of your heart. We're rising from the ashes to Joy, 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 light in my soul. The joy, 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 making me whole, though I'm broken. I am running into your arms of love. The joy, 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 light in my soul. The joy, 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 making me whole, though I'm broken. this morning, whether you're here in person or whether you're worshiping with us virtually, we're equally as glad that all of you are participating in our worship service this morning. It's the third Sunday of Advent already, excuse me, the fourth Sunday of Advent already. We've been through three of them. It's hard to believe that Christmas is less than a week away. Christmas Eve this coming Friday night, of course, always a an exciting time here at University Heights. That service begins at 5 o'clock p.m., and we hope that all of you can be there and bring your family. It will be a, a special, special candlelight uh, communion service, uh, one of our favorite services of the year each year. That's on Friday night at 5 o'clock, and then, of course, Saturday morning, Christmas morning, and then Sunday, the day after Christmas, we'll meet as a church to worship together, and we're going to focus on carols, singing Christmas carols, on Sunday the 26th. There won't be any life groups that morning. We'll just meet together in worship and, and sing a lot of songs together, and it should be absolutely wonderful. If you're visiting with us this morning, there are connection cards on the, the ends of the pews or, or in the pew in front of you. We'd love for you to fill one of those out, and then before you leave this morning, make sure you shake a hand, and, and we have a gift for you as well, and so feel free to grab one of those uh, before you leave um, the worship this morning. We're just so blessed to be here together. We're going to sing one more time, but before we do, we get to light the fourth Advent candle, and so we're going to invite the Prickett family to come and, and lead us through that. flame, we signify the love of God that surrounds and fills us at all times, but that, we rec but that we recognize in a special way in the Christmas story. There's no greater power than love. It is stronger than rulers and empires, stronger than grief or despair, stronger even than death. 
We love because God loves us. Loving God, we open ourselves to you this Christmas season. As these candles are lit, light our lives with your imagination. Show us the creative power of hope. Teach us the peace that comes from justice. Fill us with the kind of joy that cannot be contained, but must be shared. Magnify your love within us. Prepare our hearts to be transformed, transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. We will welcome the challenge of discipleship. We will offer ourselves as God's ministers. We will go forth in hope, peace, joy, and love. Let us pray. Dear God, as our Advent pilgrimage draws to completion, grant us the courage to share your love, love for the unexpected challenge, love for the vulnerable one, love for the presence of God. Amen. has been a journey that is full of miracles. Four years ago, I think I was that little boy with shattered dreams, all not focused because of many things that I've gone through. We fled the war from South Sudan and we came here together with my twin brother to Kampala. 
it started at night we had to run out we left our parents we don't know where they are right now right now we are on our own when i look at that and compare right now i think all my dreams are being brought up to reality when i look at jacob right now uh he had a dream of being a doctor he is pursuing to be a doctor and indeed it's happening it's coming to, to reality i've been doing international relations and diplomacy and one of my goals is really to to reach refugees and the less privileged one as i look back uh, i just know like god has placed people in my life and these people have given me glimpses of the savior you know people that introduced to me jesus bit by bit in light of covid i honestly miss i miss home i can say home refuge and hope is my home and i can relate to genesis chapter 37 to 50 the story of uh, joseph god was shaping joseph through throughout the journey he was shaping him into the vessel that he can use him for his purpose i believe that god is shaping us to be to be what he wanted us to be Dear God, thank you for the wonderful way you take care of all our needs. Your daily care means so much to each of us. We pray for those people around the world who are not as fortunate as we are. Help them find ways to have their daily needs met. May the needs of their souls also be met through saving faith in Jesus Christ. Be with the missionaries and other Christians in their lives as their minister to them. Give them hope and peace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
have all children come up for children's message this morning? Good morning, cutie kids. I have a question. Who likes mail? Anybody? Has anybody ever gotten their, like, a package or, like, a letter with their name in the mail before? Isn't it kind of special? You know, you kind of, and then you, like, you get it and you kind of shake it, and then you know that you need to get, like, an adult to help you with scissors to open it, like, you know? But sometimes you just kind of want to just rip it open, you know? Just get in there. Has it, have you done that before? It goes everywhere. Packing peanuts, but like the little popple things. Who loves the popples? You know, the little, that's more. Sometimes that's more fun than the actual present. You know, little poppy thing. Or like the packing peanuts. I used to help my grandma pack stuff, and we had packing peanuts everywhere. It's fun to get something in the mail. Um, it's fun to have a package. A lot of times, sometimes if people send you a package, and maybe you see somebody else's name on it, they're like, "Oh, somebody sent this just for me." Right? And then you want to rip it open, okay? Sometimes, maybe, um, it brings you lots of joy, which you talked about joy. But this one has my name on it, Abigail M. Hathcock, University Heights. So it's like full of stuff, you know? When I order things and it brings, I get to open it, and a lot of times it's probably gifts for you guys. Right? It's fun. But, you know, I think, whoops, whatever is in there is probably broken now. That's okay. Um, the thing that I find interesting, Amazon. You know, they really have it going on because look at their what's their la what's their label package? What is what's like their you know how Nike has the swoosh? What's their emblem? What what when you see this emblem and you see Amazon? What is it? What is that? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, a smiley face. Well, huh? When you have joy, typically you smile. I would hope. When you love something or someone, typically, I hope you would smile. You would never want to say, I love you, right? That doesn't really feel too warm and fuzzy. So, you know, it's interesting. Amazon gives the joy or the showing the love through their emblem. But you know what's great? When you get stuff, people send you stuff. Does, does that stuff bring you joy or things that you love? Yeah? But what happens when you get older? What if inside your package was like, you know, an uh, awesome pair of Christmas pajamas? Maybe cookie cutters. Uh, Amanda and Brian, in case you haven't gotten gifts, cookie cutters on the list. <laughs> um, right? Sometimes when you get, um, we get sent things like Christmas um, pajamas. Well, you're going to get older and you're going to grow out of them, right? Sometimes you get, you get sent gifts. Um, that's maybe technology, and technology gets old, or it breaks, or it's not really trustworthy. What about a toy? Has anyone ever broken a toy? Like it goes to the land of no return, and like there's no way we can hot glue or super glue it back together. It's just done, right? Sometimes love and joy are temporary, but that's stuff that fits in a box, right? You know, when you think about somebody who loves you, and if Trey had his way, he would probably get a package for me, and then this is how it would appear underneath the tree. He cannot wrap to save his life. Honestly, trash bags probably would suit it better. But, right, the joy somebody gives or the love someone wants to show you, when they think about you intentionally to wrap your present to make it look pretty and special, right, that's important. But did you know the love and joy that Jesus has for you and that God has for you by sending Jesus does not fit in a box because all of that stuff might bring us joy and might give us the lovey-dovey warm feelings from that person that gave it to us but it's going to break it might not last forever the great thing about who Jesus is the joy that Jesus gives us and the love that he came to give us can't fit in a box it's too big it's too wide it's too vast when you think of the nativity that we did last last week, and we think of the star, how bright that star is shown. That's like the love that God has for us. It shines so bright. 
And so as we celebrate this holiday season, I know opening packages and waiting for your shipping to actually get here on time <laughs> and checking and checking and checking to make sure it'll get here is fun. But what's most important is not necessarily the stuff that's in it. Maybe it's the love of the person that gave it to you. And when we think about that, we should think about God, the love that God has for us to give us Jesus, okay? So um, let's go ahead and pray. There's busy bags in the back talking about love and joy for us to be in big service today, okay? Father God, I come to you now, and I thank you um, for letting us learn through the action that you gave us in Jesus. Help us to equate that um, all week this week and the things that we do and how we prepare um, and how we plan and how we um, think of others with wrapping gifts and, and giving something special that's thoughtful. But God, help us remember that it's not about the stuff, that it's about you. And the love that you've given us is the best gift that we could ever receive. Help us to treat others with that same love, that same kindness, and that same compassion. We love you, and we thank you for this time to learn and grow in your name. Amen. Okay, let's head back to our seats.
let's stand and, and let's sing some more together.
Amen. Good morning, church. A couple days ago, I asked our daughter Harlow, who's our youngest, who is five. She's going to get nervous now because I'm talking about her in church. I asked her what she thought Santa Claus was going to bring her. And without a moment's hesitation, she said, what I wrote in my letter, of course. She's very confident that Santa's going to bring her what's in her letter. And I'm, I'm confident, too, that... Friday night when we gather for our Christmas Eve worship, that that's going to be a special time together as a church family. I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to invite somebody along with you. You know, sometimes we feel a little bit awkward inviting people to church or things like that, but it's easier when we have something to invite them to. And Friday night when we gather together for our candlelight worship, uh, you have something good to invite them to. And I want to encourage you uh, to do that. It's going to be a great night uh, together of worship. If you have your Bible with you this morning, you can go ahead and open that to Luke chapter 2, as we, of course, think this morning about the birth of Jesus. And this morning, we're thinking about woodworking. Now, I know it might seem strange to think about woodworking and then transition to cake, but we're going to transition there in a second. But first, let's read the scripture together. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing which has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told, about, told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God, for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of God for the people of God. I think I may have shared with you before that my kids love these baking shows on TV. Anybody ever watch these baking competition shows on TV? All right. It's, I don't know. There's a myriad of them. There's all kinds of them. They love to watch these baking shows. It's amazing to me on a day when we really have nothing to do and on a day where... Where, where we allow them to watch TV for longer than they normally watch it for, how many episodes they can watch of a baking show in a row without getting bored of watching a baking show. But they do that. There are some fascinating takes on the baking show. Fascinatingly good, and if you've watched before, fascinatingly bad. Have you noticed how our expectation of things sometimes doesn't actually work out in reality? What we expect from a situation, what we expect from a project, what we expect to get out of something doesn't work out the way that we expect it. In fact, sometimes it's a very long way off. I want to show you a few pictures this morning of some cakes that didn't exactly work out the way that they anticipated. They wanted a cat. They kind of got a cat, I guess. Could be a cat. What's the next one, Brian? M Minnie Mouse L ended up more like a possum than a mouse. a hedgehog or something like porcupine maybe I don't know and the last and my favorite is Olaf the Olaf cake did not quite turn out as anticipated 
Sometimes what we expect and the reality we get are very far from one another. If you've ever baked a cake and it's ended up like that before, you know what I'm talking about. We also sort of experience that when we do some DIY things around the house, right? We don't want to pay somebody to do it. We think we can do it ourselves, or maybe it's nothing that we really need done, but it's something that we want. We saw this cool thing on Pinterest or Facebook, and we want to put it together, and then it doesn't exactly turn out the way that we anticipated. Three or four years ago, I saw this really cool end table on Facebook or Pinterest or something, and it was a, it was a, a, a slice of, of wood, and it was gorgeous. And I thought, I'll make that for Lisa for Christmas. So I found the perfect piece of wood for that, nice slab of oak, and I went and I watched several YouTube videos and I read several articles. I went to the hardware store. I got all of the things I needed. I, I, I spent hours on this thing. I finished it, and it looked awful. And I took it straight from the garage where I had been working on it, and I pitched it immediately into the trash can. Sometimes things don't work out like we want them. This morning, I want us to think about woodworking. If you've ever worked with wood before, you know sometimes things go well and sometimes things don't go so well. I want us to think about the cradle and the cross, to, to think about the road from the manger to the cross and the story of redemption that God invites us into and invites us to be a part of this story too. From the very beginning of time, or we might rephrase that and say from the beginning of the New Testament, the reactions to Jesus have remained the same throughout the course of time. The faces that we see around the cradle are also the faces that we see around the cross of Christ. In the eyes of the world and in the eyes of secular history, the cradle and the cross represent the two weakest points in the life of Jesus. The greatest weakness, in fact. From the cradle in Bethlehem, Jesus grew in strength and, of course, grew in his divine manhood until the moment that he willingly surrendered those things on the cross and once again became as weak as the one in the cradle. But when we see those things and we think weakness, we've got it all mixed up. We've got it all confused. That's the way maybe that the world sees these moments, the way that secular history would describe the cradle and the cross, yet nowhere in his ministry did Jesus shake the world than in those two greatest moments of weakness. For in those two moments of his apparent weakness, think about what happened. Kings were afraid. A city, the holy city, was shaken. The heavens were shaken, and Emmanuel, God with us, was present and powerful and at work. In those two moments of so-called weakness, dem Jesus demonstrates his power in ways in ways that are hard to comprehend. But it is in his weakness that he demonstrates his power. The, the, it may seem weird to, to think and to compare the beauty of the cradle versus the torment and the agony of the cross, and it seems like we're kind of trying to compare expectation and reality like we did a few moments ago when we looked at those cakes. But if we dig a little deeper, we see how the wood of the cradle and the wood of the cross are connected and how they invite us into this story that God has written and is writing and will write and that he wants us to be written into too. Around the cradle of Jesus, there of course is Herod and, and all of Jerusalem with him are troubled. That's what Matthew 2 records for us. Think about that paradox, if you would. There is this king, this person who can basically do and have anything he wants, who is raging with anger and fear and worry over a baby. And at the last, there's another Herod, about 33 years later, who is shaken by the crucified Christ. And think about that paradox. A man who is nailed to a tree, bleeding away his life. And the rulers powers and the principalities that surround him are shaken. Because as Paul wrote, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
in the cradle of Christ and the cross of Christ, there is this same sequence that we see in both scenarios. There's revelation and there's proclamation and there's reaction. And there's either acceptance to that, like the shepherds, acceptance of what God is doing in the world, and there's a response of worship. Or there's rejection and there's persecution. All of those things are wrapped up in the paradox of God. This great reversal of things in the world, this unfathomable wisdom of God, we see it in the cradle. We see it on the cross. Paul goes on to say in that same passage of Scripture that God chose the foolish things of the world that he might put to shame them that are wise. And God chose the weak things of the world that he might put to shame the things that are strong. What happens in the lives of people is people are shaken and as people have this response in different ways across the spectrum happens in creation too, of course. The star announces that Jesus is born. The earth shakes at the death of Jesus. But the story goes on. The story goes on actually both ways. This story doesn't begin with a cradle, and this story doesn't end with a cross. This story began long before that cradle. As John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But Jesus is uncreated. And the story, of course, doesn't end with the cross, too. We know, of course, that Jesus is buried and that he doesn't stay in that tomb, that by the very power of God that he is raised from the dead, and death is not the end of the story for Jesus. But life, in fact, life is the ongoing story. Life that is never-ending, life that is full, life that is filled with purpose and, and passion. But as we think about what woodworking means, we think about the cradle, we, we, we look to the cross, we look to the empty tomb, as we think about those things and we think about this story at Christmas time, we know that this isn't just a story that happened a couple of thousand years ago. This isn't a story that, that, that is finished and that happened a couple of thousand years ago in the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, a span of about 33 years, it's not over. It's a story, in fact, that every single one of us and that all the world is being invited to participate in. It's a story that every single one of us and all of the world is invited to live into and to be a part of. And so it's not just about thinking about uh, the, the wood of the cradle and the wood of the cross. It's thinking about our own lives, too. Thinking about how we fit into the story. How we can join our story. And that happens through the work of the heart that God does in each of us. So I want you to think about your own life. I want you to think about your own heart. Your own decisions, your own worship, your own choices, all of those things. I want you to think about you and how you fit into that story. And if you'll allow me, I want to stretch Jesus' parable of the sower a little bit, and I want you to think about your heart as a piece of wood. We're reminded of the cradle and the wood that it's made of. We're reminded of the cross and the wood that it's made of, and I want you to think about your heart as a piece of wood. How many of you have ever done anything with wood before? Have you worked with wood, cut some up, made something, tried to make something, failed miserably at something, had great success making something? Okay, lots of you know that there are different, of course, types of wood because there's different types of trees, and some of those trees are easy to cut, and some of those trees are a lot harder to cut. Some of those trees are really soft and pliable, and there's no issue at all. It's light wood. It's easy to work with, and others are a lot more challenging and are a lot more difficult, a lot harder. So I want you to think about your heart on the spectrum of soft and pliable and willing to be, be spoken into and on the other end of the spectrum hard and tough and rigid where is that? where does yours fall? you know we start on one end of the spectrum and we get fir and we get pine that's easy and, and then we get to oak and we get to maple and way over here on this end of the spectrum 
we don't have any of these. We don't have any of these that grow in Missouri that I know of, at least not southwest Missouri. But in South Texas, we have this thing called mesquite trees. And they're tough and they're gnarly and they're extremely hard. And you know, it's really easy for us to sit back and it's easy for us to say this with the parable of the sower. It's easy to say this with, as we think about our hearts as a piece of wood, it's easy for us to say, uh, my, my heart is over here on this end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm, I'm easy, right? I'm soft, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm will, willing to allow God to speak to my heart. And we maybe think about other people, and we think, well, they're over there on that end of the spectrum. Their, heart, their heart's a lot harder. But with the parable of the sower, and with my own little parable, I guess, I think we make a mistake if we think about that. It's too easy for me to say, and look at my own life and say, yeah, I'm here on the spectrum, but I don't know that Jesus really thinks of it that way. Because in my own life, there are things, there are challenges, there are choices, there are things in my life where, man, I don't have any issue with it, things at all. And I say, God, do your work in my life work at my heart, but then I've got other things in my life and in my heart and, and, and in myself that are on the other end of the spectrum, and I'm not so willing to let God speak to those areas. All of us, every single one of us, are across the board on this. It's too easy for us to say we're one place or another or to point to other people and make ourselves feel better. We all have parts of our heart that are soft, and we all have parts of our heart that are difficult. And we all have our own story. We all have our own uh, we all have our own successes and our own failures. We all have the things in our lives that are easy for us to work through and the things that are hard for us to work through. And every single one of us, and some of us have more prominent ones than others, but every single one of us have scars in our lives. Things that we did that we wish we wouldn't have. Choices that we made that we wish we could go back and remake again. Things that we have had to carry with us and burdens or challenges. We all have those things and if we're not careful we begin to think that those things uh, affect, affect God's love for us or affect our, 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 our ministry to people around us. How many of you know what a burl is? You know what a burl is? You ever seen a tree with a burl? A tree with a burl is an ugly tree. Let me just go ahead and tell you that. So I'm going to show you a picture of one and share it in a second. There it is. That's an ugly tree. Can we all agree with that? That's a really ugly tree. It looks like it should go st grow straight, and then we've got this ugly, huge knot in the middle of it. You know, people that actually know what they're doing, working with wood, not me, people that actually know what they're doing, hunt all over for those things. Because when they actually get into those things and they cut it open, those burls that grow on trees are more beautiful than anything else you could ever get out of a tree anywhere else. Look at the inside. So I want you to think about what that would look like in a piece of furniture or a bowl or something else. What made it look ugly on the outside actually is absolutely gorgeous on the inside. If God can design things in a way to make that work for a tree, how much more might God do for people? How much more might God do for those whom Christ laid in the cradle for? And how much more might he do for those whom Christ died on the cross for and walked out of an empty tomb for. And so this Christmas season, as we think about the cross and we think about the cradle and as we think about the empty tomb, we shouldn't forget where we find ourselves in the story too. And that God wants to do work in our hearts. Would you stand, would you bow your heads? And close your eyes and let's pray together. As we prepare to pray, I want to encourage you to respond to the work of God in your life. 
Maybe that means believing in him for the very first time. Maybe that means joining your life and the life of your family to the life of University Heights. Maybe it means simply just spending some time in prayer as we sing together. God, we are thankful for your work in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you for the cradle. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. And we thank you for what it means in our lives that we, too, can have a part in this great story of faith that is unfolding before us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to remind you that there's nothing going on this Wednesday night. Um, no, nothing will be happening this Wednesday night. And, of course, our uh, candle light service will be on Friday at uh, 5 o'clock. And then next Sunday, we're only having worship at 1030. No life groups next Sunday. Okay? Let's sing together one more time, and we'll be dismissed.